Okay, uh, Terry's asked a good question about um, what am I referring to when I mentioned core readings? And um, yes, I, looking again at the website on the resources page, I'm reminded I had a bunch of supplementary ones and then some that are uh, more significant than others and it's not clear. So I've just got uh, two main ones in mind, plus immodestly the one I gave you from myself at the beginning of the semester. Uh, so I'll just simply put the names of the authors there. Um, mindful that we've only got uh, less than a week to go. Okay. And The one for myself, don't get hung up on all the theory or anything. Um, the main main aspects of it are the, uh, the, the set of issues about uh, massive demands upon the audience uh, uh, attention, ability to pay attention, and what and the implications uh, therefore for communications. That's not the focus of the story, actually. The, uh, the focus of the uh, that chapter is more about creative endeavors, so more focused on artists and whatnot. Um, although there are interesting questions about um, how one strikes a balance between consumption and production, that when we have the whole stock of the world's content, um, a lot of historical cultural content and contemporary cultural content available just to us on YouTube, for example, you could spend all day every day uh, watching YouTube and uh, still only uh, touch a bare fraction of the cultural resources available there so you can be forever ever consuming and never producing and uh, simultaneously there's also a set of issues for um, anyone uh, who ends up with any degree of prominence uh, whether they're celebrities whether they're artists intellectuals business leaders or whatever um, it's a, a a uh, double-edged sword, the uh, the ability to connect socially uh, through social media, to be able to communicate very quickly with people, um, and then the danger that you end up in a completely reactive mode. And so how do a whole bunch of talented, creative people and leaders feel about that? Um, it potentially allows them to talk to stakeholders, to, to go around the old gatekeepers, for example, uh, the old media barons, the, uh, the editors and whatnot, to talk directly to communities. And so Barack Obama did that, Donald Trump did that, for example. We see a lot of artists doing that. Um, at the same time, you can uh, be in a very dangerous position because you're constantly reacting to other people reacting to stuff you put out. And um, that, that can leave you no space for the really deep thinking and finding your own voice and your own style and whatnot. That's a, that's a whole set of issues. So they're the main things I, I think out of my chapter there that would be relevant for our conversation directly relate to, relate to the conclusions um, in the chapter. Uh, the uh, Craig um, article is very heavy. I don't expect people to really master it, but uh, to have a familiarity with it. And I've uh, explicitly talked about the Craig article in, in the overview. In fact, let me, um, there's something I want to do to, to steer everyone towards this, because this final quiz, I, I never examined you on the communications theory stuff. I said I was gonna hold that off until later on. Um, I did do two short videos that are on the website, connected to on the website, and of course off the, uh, the YouTube channel. So let me go straight actually into the um, slides from then. Um, I'm not going to do them deeply because I've got some other things I want to cover here today um, and it's our very last class so I uh, want to uh, not just be completely one way and uh, want to share some of the stuff that yourselves have done actually too but let's briefly have a look at those those theory issues um, now we're with me for a moment, I opened up before and now it's disappeared. Good. 
the top. Okay, so the, these are some of the very early theorists on communications. And um, I did ask a question to about, about that stuff because we, we touched on that, but then I didn't finish off this, this discussion in the class. Okay, so the, uh, the discussion of the Craig article um, is particularly significant because the way that he mapped the, uh, the field as a whole and understand the very different academic and theoretical approaches to communication from different perspectives. So um, um, having looked through that article and getting a sense of how he understood communication theory as a field and mapped that is something that's interesting. So that's the main contribution. And there's a nice visualization of it from his own article actually. And so that's why I put that in the article like this in the, here in the, uh, in the lecture notes. Okay. Um, the key sets of theoretical issues I just want to remind you of, and I'd encourage you to look through these um, lecture notes yourself, they're pretty self-explanatory, and that's why I was not so worried about being a talking head uh, earlier on in the semester when there's so many other things to, to cover. Uh, the key thing is, in, in a sense, critical perspectives on communications, corporate communications and political communications but depending on the critical perspective where they're coming from, they have rather different implications in terms of what they focus on. So we tend to see that what was referred to as the Frankfurt School, very often Marxist, but not uh, um, really hardcore Marxist, some of them. Um, some of them were Marxist in terms of theory, but politically more pragmatic. Uh, They're obviously very focused on um, powerful corporate um, enterprises and communications after World War II in America, but their primary concern in an earlier period, particularly in uh, Germany where they, uh, they came from, of course, Frankfurt, um, was in fact the way that the Nazi state used um, modern communications means. The Nazis, as I talked about right in the beginning of the semester, very deliberately put to use some of the latest practices in advertising to actually promote the, uh, the Nazi regime. And pretty much all of the prominent scholars associated uh, with the pre-war Frankfurt School fled Nazi Germany, ended up in the United States. Many stayed on there uh, permanently. Some returned to Germany, um, some went, went to and fro. So they were modernists, they were rationalists. They still kind of held hope that uh, society could be reformed for the better um, along kind of rationalist lines but they were acutely critical of the way that modern communications technology were used to justify authoritarian states. And then later on, powerful enterprises sometimes corruptly interacting with um, political actors, uh, again, to preserve the existing social order. So the postmodernists are rather different, uh, much more French influence, uh, very, uh, strong bottom up sense in terms of perspective of culture. They, uh, they were uh, less interested in elite culture, more interested in offering a corrective to the Marxist view that the, uh, the culture industries, as they're often referred to, um, as opposed to the creative industries, culture industry, very famously with the uh, uh, theorists that came out of particularly Birmingham and cultural studies, they really focused on elite culture and how elite culture perpetuated the existing ruling order and things like that. Uh, the postmodernists were had much more nuance in a way. They were looking at micro level agency about how, although states and companies may use the power of mass communications to try and promote their own interests, that in fact, a lot of people took those messages with a grain of salt. They kind of interacted with them creatively. They, uh, they made of them what they wanted to make of them. So rather more focused on individual agency, but uh, at the same time, didn't buy into some of the great enlightenment ideals that many of the, uh, the German um, Frankfurt centered uh, theorists still held hope for. So a range of implications, uh, as we said here, particularly focusing on microcultures, partly reaction to the whole, whole Cold War grand narratives and whatnot. In many respects, you can argue that postmodernism is essentially a, a, an aesthetic and also, as I say here, a label for a certain approach to critical academic analysis of, of cultural fact, um, artifacts. Became much more interested in pop culture, street culture, for example, 
And I think that uh, a lot of postmodernist theory, although very theoretically heavy and a real struggle and often parodied for that reason, uh, some of the analytical assumptions and approaches are actually very complementary to understanding contemporary social media and how people make use of social media, for example. Uh, some of the big, big names, uh, particularly Baudrillard, um, hugely interesting scholar with his notion of um, hyper-reality where simulation is effectively reality. We live in a world of created realities that become reality. Yeah, he, he used so many examples of the Big Apple version of New York, modern homes, TV dramas, you know, that we have conversations about real life events with reference to some actually fictional benchmark, uh, a common cultural reference point, a television show, for example, a dynamic that, that been, um, everybody knows about. In a strange kind of way, for example, when we talk about, as I've done in this course too, when we talk about advertising, uh, in recent years, it's uh, just normal to talk about um, Mad Men. Everybody references Mad Men as this shared reference point for Madison Avenue and the advertising industry and whatnot. But you know, Mad Men was a was a TV drama. It uh, was to some degree informed, of course, by the realities of Madison Avenue. But it is quite literally taken on the life of its own. Baudrillard, far from saying that this was kind of false consciousness in terms of that's the term that the uh, the famous. Um, Italian radical Antonio Gramsci uh, talked about um, notion of false consciousness and and how uh, and particularly hegemony hegemony um, rather than people uh, effectively succumbing to this cynical ideology which dumbs people down removes their revolutionary rigor uh, Baudrillard for example who said that it's actually inevitable that we live in a realm of abstractions, of stories, that there's always a disconnect between reality and narrative, and that the, the narrative and the images that uh, we use to navigate the world for us become our actually experienced realities in so many ways. And in this incredibly bizarre kind of way, I'm now talking to a device, um, and you're looking at a device and you're hopefully making sense of what I'm saying, if I'm making sense, and effectively how is this happening? Um, we are electronically transmitting squillions of zeros and ones, uh, digital uh, communications, and uh, effectively at the end of this class you will have said that you will have seen me for the equivalent of 90 minutes or something, um, but you've actually seen a device, a screen, a, a kind of a visual rendering of me. Um, maybe I don't really exist, maybe I'm just an avatar, maybe maybe the system has just generated me. I don't believe that because um, if anyone was going to design a system uh, that's sophisticated, why would they make an ugly bugger like me? I'm sure they would come up with someone far more engaging. So the very, the very uh, uh, fact of our imperfections actually is the best evidence, I think, of reality there. By the way, philosophers have an astonishing capacity throughout history to tie themselves in knots on this. Um, there is a famous anecdote about two philosophers having an argument and saying, is there any reality? Is there a real reality or do we only think there is a reality there? And so one philosopher said to the other philosopher, if you doubt the reality of that wall, try and walk through it. And so he tried and he slammed into it and nearly knocked himself out. Um, and that changed his philosophical view. So most people think, what a lot of rubbish, uh, but there is actually quite very significant um, philosophical meaning to a lot of these debates about what do we actually understand uh, as reality? Because the vast majority of things that people refer to as truth or reality are actually not. They are stories, they are narratives, they are um, socially and culturally constructed facts. Um, Derrida is another huge name in, in postmodernism and particularly using semiotics and a notion of deconstruction, uh, looking at language and text as signs and trying to deconstruct the, uh, the layers of meaning in them. And this has some influence in terms of critique market research, for example, if one is trying to make sense of a particular culture and values around a product, then actually looking at the way the media and advertising, for example, talks about that product in a very specific cultural context can give you some real clues about how you actually should communicate to, uh, to consumers. Uh, a friend of mine uh, working with a branding consultancy does a lot of semiotic work, for example, and I, I, I can talk generally about it now. Uh, he had a uh, client who really wanted to know about coffee culture in Japan and was really trying to make sense of how Japanese made sense of coffee and the seeming paradox of having K 
canned coffee everywhere for 110 yen, um, ranging through to artisan or hipster coffee, um, and then the massively overpriced, not very nice coffee that you get in classic hotel lobbies and whatnot, which is the most expensive coffee in Japan and some of the worst sometimes, um, and trying to understand the cultural context there. So you can actually do a deep dive into all the media and the symbolism, um, the communications around product, and actually deconstruct the various uh, attendant values. Um, my friend who runs that company, he and I have, have keep bouncing back ideas um, to write a paper together quite explicitly on um, kind of the Showa retro take on Hawaii. So Hawaii in the post-war Japanese imagination and that whole resort kibun and aloha kind of thing. And uh, we, we can very much see a Showa retro take on Hawaii that manifests in terms of actually a lot of the construction of images um, and indeed of actual hotel decor and whatnot in Okinawa and other resorts in Showa Yonju Nendo when people couldn't afford to go to Hawaii, for example. And then you see the Hawaiians resort created up in Tohoku. So uh, one possible explanation there is that in fact, in rapidly urbanizing and at the time kind of polluted and very work, hard working and socially responsible post-war Japan, Hawaii became almost this um, alter ego, this, this uh, um, uh, contrary, aspirational, everything that Japanese would like to be, but either couldn't be for socially constructed reasons or because they just simply would not let themselves to be, which is, which is uh, part of that anyway. Uh, so, and, and I think you do see this when, when Japanese go off to Waikiki, particularly uh, lots of women you see dressing in big flowing, bright flowery dresses and whatnot that they would uh, very often never wear in uh, Tokyo. Um, so that kind of aloha kibun thing. So you, you can do this in so many, in so many cultures in a similar kind of way, we, we could do very sophisticated deconstruction of the image of France, France in Japanese consumer culture and particularly in um, affluent middle-class um, post-war Japanese women's uh, culture, the, the construct of France and Paris and Parisian style and whatnot. And, and you can do everything from studying the way stores uh, set up their interior through to advertising messages, magazines, all of those kind of things that give us a certain construction of France, for example. Um, one of the fundamental issues with theory in general is just how much audience savvy is there? Do we really assume that people are easily suckered? That if we just get control of the mass media, we can convince people to act against their own interests. This was a strong notion from some in the left, uh, particularly trying to make sense of popular support for Adolf Hitler, who by any means was a pretty silly looking guy. Um, but had in managed to gain enormous influence, although actually never won a majority of the votes in, in pre-war Germany. It's easy to forget, but we see the mass hysteria and whatnot. So that lent uh, uh, some evidence to views that uh, people could be led to act against their interests. And also the left Marxists always had to, uh, when advocating a uh, significant change to society, indeed revolutionary change, they always had a fundamental problem of how to account for the fact that the vast majority of even working class voters didn't vote for Marxist parties, that they actually very often voted for more conservative parties. And so these notions of kind of false consciousness or, or alienation from your essential self. And uh, it's either implicit or sometimes it's quite explicit. Gramsci in his very famous prison notebooks, he wrote was held in prison. Um, in Italy under the fascist regime, for example, spoke about false consciousness. So as I've said earlier, postmodern writers tend to see more scope for audiences to critically engage with messages. And more recent research tends to suggest that clever communications can nudge people towards a more um, intense commitment to an idea that they're already inclined to believe. So, for example, with Hitler and the Nazis in um, the early 1930s, particularly after a long period of economic hardship and the national 
tragedy of World War I and then losing it and a sense of all this loss of over a million lives was, was for nothing and suddenly the war came to an end. So this, this theory of national betrayal took hold and it was attractive that we could have won the war if only we'd stuck it out, but we would, the nation was somehow stabbed in the back by enemies within. So appealing to paranoia, um, people wanted something to blame. We had uh, someone and something to blame for outcomes that were undesirable. So we do see uh, that a minor very often a minority of people might have a, pro uh, a contrarian proclivity. They want to believe something other than the dominant story. And then someone in a timely fashion comes along and slips in a, uh, uh, convincing narrative and they latch onto that and they they make it their own but they were all they're already primed to believe uh, so we see the Trump for example clearly in a bunch of underperforming rust belt um, deindustrializing uh, states uh, was able to tap dissatisfaction uh, that was already there so on the on the other hand uh, Trump didn't fundamentally flip large numbers of uh, people uh, from a completely different political perspective. So they may have switched their political allegiance, but they were never particularly uh, locked on to say the Democrats. And we see a similar kind of thing with, I think the, uh, the last national election in Britain that Boris Johnson, particularly up in places like Wales and whatnot was able to win people around to Brexit uh, although people had often voted Labour, uh, they were able to use a particular issue and to tap dissatisfaction, nudge people that way. So it's not simply having lots of money, you can change people's mind against their interests, that if they have some latent issue or proclivity to think something or more likely feel something, and then you deliver the message in an effective way with a hook that people can grab, uh, can attach their particular concerns to, then then you can be effective. It's not as simply as just blanket um, promotion of your agenda and everybody falls for it. Okay. Okay, so I also touch on these issues in the conclusion slides uh, that I've put up there. So now I want to turn to the... Um, radical take on communications, dissatisfaction, and uh, let me get those slides going, happening here. Disconsent, discontent. Okay, well, first of all, if, um, Comedy always helps to get your message across. Uh, this has been quite cleverly done. Many people will have seen this has been around for, around for quite a while. Uh, it really is quite brilliant and uh, very, very cute. Uh, and uh, apparently in the PRC, then uh, there's, there's a whole lot of inter interventions for social media to actually uh, stop Winnie the Pooh references and whatnot. Uh, because it can be uh, seen as kind of damaging political parody. Uh, but they've, uh, with Eeyore, they really have nailed it with Abyssam, haven't they? So I don't know how Abyssam would feel about that. If I was him, I would think that'd be pretty cool, actually. Okay. Um, what we've seen, of course, with uh, protest, we've seen protest movements in a number of places. We saw the, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, we saw very interesting uh, student process, protests and student occupation of the parliament in Taiwan, which, uh, worked out in a really interesting civilized kind of way. This was a few years back. Uh, the student demonstrators who took over the Taiwanese parliament eventually left and um, in, in a similar fashion to the reputation of Japanese crowds for cleaning up the soccer stadium before they left, they uh, kind of meticulously cleaned up and polished the, <laughs> the parliament after um, having occupied it for ages and uh, generally all in all boosted Taiwan's reputation for having quite a kind of a robust liberal political culture. Of course, in 2019, it seems like so long ago now, but it's very, very recently, um, we saw very intense, prolonged protests. And this, there's been a series of ongoing, ongoing protests, which um, have origins, well, long, long, long origins, uh, but very significant uh, political movement, uh, 
uh, from earlier in the decade, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And of course, just most recently, we've seen that the, uh, the government of PRC has been not only unmoved by that, but has made a very forceful uh, intervention, changing the uh, fundamental legal basis of um, Hong Kong self-governance now and really scaring a lot of the activists into retreat and a number of governments have been actually talking about creating visa regimes. Uh, in fact, Australia is heading in this direction uh, to allow people to relocate from Hong Kong if they're um, dissatisfied with the political direction. Uh, but uh, even though the Hong Kong case uh, is deeply disappointing for many, many people in Hong Kong, uh, we nonetheless can say that governments just can no longer engage in just one-way communications um, and just assume that there will be audience compliance. Now, uh, to a significant degree, this has always been the case, uh, but uh, audiences didn't have the same means of coordinating their voices, speaking back, uh, rallying people to protest, for example, in a timely fashion. The emergent uh, highly innovative techniques that we see there um, in Hong Kong as particularly con crowd control mechanisms evolved and then these creative responses. Uh, in the final set of slides I put together, the, uh, the very final slide actually for the semester is the latest iteration. This is actually from Portland, Oregon, the United States. Uh, the, the latest clever response to tear gas, one way is to try and hit the tear gas canisters back with a tennis racket. Um, but in Portland, Oregon, the really interesting one now is we're having literally dad's armies of uh, activists supporting protesters who are out with their leaf blowers and blowing the uh, tear gas back over the uh, police themselves to the point where it was such an effective response that the police have gone out and also bought themselves some good Japanese makita and yobi um, leaf blowers to then blow their own tear gas off themselves back towards the protesters. So literally you have a war of dueling leaf blowers. Uh, one of the most interesting things I've seen in terms of media commentary in Australia about this, because it's got a lot of attention, is so many people say that they are the most um, annoying device um, invented in decades. Enormous numbers of people are woken up too early on a Sunday morning by the idiot neighbour deciding to blow the leaves off their lawn at 7am or something, and so that finally they actually have a decent um, social purpose. So clearly, of course, audiences can talk amongst themselves to others and talk back, and, I'm, and I quite imagine that uh, some of you are probably uh, you know, online or something right now and that we have um, two-channel communications. Uh, I actually put something on the my general teaching website inviting people to take the piss out of me to to mash up parodies of my speaking camera, uh, my, my streamed classes and whatnot. I still offer a reward for anyone who does a, a clever parody of me. Uh, but as part of explaining that, and it's still on the top site of uh, pocketan.com, I uh, have some links there to some Australian comedians, Roy and, Roy and HG are legendary for actually um, making this a fun comedic routine. They became very famous in Australia for uh, Saturday afternoon radio stations where they're on a radio station program where they would call sports. So the TV would be broadcasting a particular sports event. Uh, they would invite uh, listeners on the radio on their TV, on their radio show, to turn down the volume on the TV broadcast, and then they would put their own commentary over the top um, and just completely change the discourse, make up names for things and whatnot. They became particularly famous in every year, or oh, every, every Olympics, they, they actually do this. And uh, particularly things like the synchronized swimming and the gymnastics and whatnot. Uh, one of their netta, one of the things they're quite famous for, is by suddenly realizing that the names for um, moves, for example, typically that are scored in a range of com competitive performance events are quite arbitrary. They've been made up by the sports associations so that you can just make up new names for things. So this is one of the netta that literally they, uh, they call the, uh, the gymnastics uh, with an entirely different uh, vocabulary that becomes very much an insider thing. And so Australians of a certain generation can actually just reference um, 
them and this language they made they made up uh, to comedic effect. People know exactly what you don't even have to mention Roy or HG, for example. And um, it does remind me of a cruel but quite clever joke by an American comedian once who said that um, he uh, really wanted to have a child and home and homeschool the child in wrong. That he wanted to have a child and teach the chi child all the wrong names for things and then send the child out into the world um, and video the effect. <laughs> it's really quite cruel. So that the child would ask for something with like a completely ridiculous name instead of asking for a glass of water, for ask for a for a fish in a bucket or, or just just idiotic stuff, whatever. Um, but this idea that one can actually um, as, as you're editing video, for example, to actually lay a completely different soundtrack um, over some video and give an entirely different meaning. Uh, those of you who want to wander onto my Zemi website, you can actually see that um, uh, Woody Allen, one of his very, very first films, I've had his first ever film, um, it was actually with Tiger Lily, he took a Japanese movie from the 1960s and put a completely different soundtrack over it. So it was all this New York Jewish in gags, which is just completely surreal. So effectively you get multiple channels. And uh, what this means is that any kind of state or corporate communications can be hijacked, can be parodied. Uh, audiences will talk amongst themselves. They'll talk back, they'll create meanings, new meanings uh, from official discourse. And then sometimes they will bring those new meanings that have been attached to often um, mundane objects that then take on political significance. And in those mundane objects can be brought into the, into the political process, for example, and people get the meaning. We'll have a look at some images. Classic examples, the umbrella movement in Hong Kong, and then particularly the, you know, the yellow umbrella becomes particularly symbolic. Um, and then the blue bucket protest in Russia. The blue bucket protest is a very interesting one. Uh, because there were repeated instances, particularly in Moscow, of lots of government officials in private cars with one of those stick-on blue um, lights. They'd wind down the window, they'd stick it on the top, the, uh, they'd put the blue light on, and they would just simply drive through red traffic lights. They uh, would routinely abuse their privileges just by having this blue light. So uh, one person did it first of all, and he went on social media that he said he went and bought a blue bucket for almost nothing. And he taped the blue bucket to the top of his car um, and therefore could freely drive his car wherever he wanted to in emergency lanes. He could park his car in the middle of Red Square or whatever. And then thousands upon thousands of people started doing this as well, taping blue buckets to their cars, you know, the back of their bicycles and a whole, a whole bunch of things. Um, and then the police stupidly tried to go and punish people for sticking a blue bucket on your car but how can you punish someone for having a blue bucket, for example? Similarly, how can you punish someone for having an umbrella in Hong Kong where it rains so much? Um, and uh, we, we see then some of these images become um, iconic later on. Uh, now, actually, the, uh, the yellow reference in the Hong Kong case, actually, some people have dated this to uh, an early protest art installation uh, inviting people to write critical messages to Be Beijing with the yellow stickets and putting them in various places. And we've seen this in Hong Kong and, uh, and protests, uh, for example, amongst um, Hong Kong students on Western campuses. Uh, last year, very often there were protest walls where stickets were put all over the wall um, and then pro PRC government students would come down and pull them down and then fights would break out and then security were called and then the media would turn up and um, it just became uh, one of those Baudrillard like kind of hyper spectacles uh, that uh, lost any kind of detachment to the, uh, the fundamental issues. So the, uh, the protest 2014 we see, for example, um, you can see lots of uh, spot yellow there as well. Um, and then particularly the, uh, these yellow umbrellas became a quiet way of protest. One only had to put a yellow up umbrella up to actually signify that uh, you were supporting the uh, movement. And we saw this actually in the, uh, the Hong Kong Legislative Chamber uh, where they were supporting this uh, movement, it also referred to as Occupy Central, that's the central part of Hong Kong. So they opened the umbrellas and indeed in the shape of an umbrella, which caused utter outrage, um, especially in Beijing, okay? And then we, uh, we see subsequently references to 
uh, that initial artwork with uh, building the sculpture like a Statue of Liberty with the yellow umbrella and whatnot. Okay. Um, and here's a particularly controversial one, 1st of October, hugely significant date um, in China, of course, it's the, uh, the founding of the People's Republic of China. Um, it's uh, National Foundation Day, effectively. And of course, every year in Hong Kong, there are formal ceremonies to mark this. And so then we had uh, people opening a yellow umbrella during the ceremonies, which um, was calculated to infuriate. Okay, and we can see the, the stick it phenomena as well. Okay, and then of course it gives rise to artistic expression. So a broader takeaway for corporate communications that stakeholders are becoming um, more demanding. The, the whole range of stakeholders, community stakeholders, of course, old media still trying to keep eyes, the uh, audiences, and so they're always looking for scandals to report on. They want old media really wants to set themselves up as the defenders of the people and uh, companies can suddenly find themselves um, not only being uh, scrutinized by new media, but by uh, very vigorous old media as well. So very strong expectations for corporate social responsibility and um, very strong emphasis to not just on how a company acts in relation to society, but also to the owners of the enterprise. So very strong emphasis on shareholders and shareholders rights and to make sure that the company is run in the interests of shareholders while also being regard, showing due regard for its social responsibilities. And those balances are actually quite difficult. If anyone's interested, I teach a whole course on enterprise and governance in the fall and some of those issues come up. Um, also, there are really big issues in terms of fairness in financial markets. And uh, every time we have a financial crisis, uh, particularly from GFC and less time, less so this time, but the GFC really uh, focused attention on uh, those privileged players in financial markets who seem to have prior access to valuable information. And when there was major financial disruption, that it was either small time shareholders or employees or the society at large uh, that suffered. So I get into very significant discussion of that in the set of slides, um, which given our limited time today, I'm not really gonna go through, uh, that are all about the legal context, uh, the, the focus on, on disclosure, for example, the foundations of um, English law and how a communications concept is critical to that. So I would really like you to engage with that set of slides. We'll see how we go time-wise. I might quickly flip through them, but I, I suspect not. Um, I'm, when I was putting them up, finishing them up last night, uh, I was very alert to them being um, self and ex self explanatory. So I think the, uh, by reading through them, you can really make sense of those points. I really don't want to get bogged down too much in uh, the compliance issues and whatnot, say with in communications with corporate governance, but I will say something about it a little bit about it later on, because there's a tension between uh, being creative and timely and being compliant with uh, very strict recent rules in terms of communications uh, relating to finance to uh, particular investor relations. So what are we seeing? Well, over 150 years of mass media now, and we had a very vibrant media from the mid 19th century, even in, uh, in Britain and the United States, for example, uh, we've seen that firms are very vulnerable to reputational shocks. And indeed, sometimes the media can trigger such a um, uh, concern about the health of a business or the, uh, the honesty of a business that can actually provoke community panics. Uh, we saw this back in uh, 1927 in Japan with the collapse of the Bank of Taiwan, which was actually a major Japanese bank. It was uh, uh, focused on developing the then colony of Taiwan. And the media played a heavy role in this at the time and through the uh, Taisho democracy period and caused a lot of panic and uh, we saw large numbers of banks um, at the time collapse. So it was quite a significant banking crisis way back in uh, 1927. So um, organizations themselves understand that to some degree, they have to disaster, disaster proof themselves by first of all, being better, being better run in the first place. If you've got, if you've got nothing to hide, uh, you're much less afraid of these kind of reputational shocks in the first place. 
but also having a capacity a capacity to deal with them because organizations are always going to make mistakes they're always going to have some problems um, you'd hope that good governance would diminish the extent of those problems uh, but you're still going to have lots of them one of the broader set of issues, of course, unguarded moments can be captured and shared with large audiences and very often they can be decontextualized, they can be misrepresented. Uh, so we're constantly being in danger of our comments being taken out of context. Politicians have to deal with this. Uh, this has led to a lot of self-censorship, arguably, that people are very cautious about speaking frankly, uh, very cautious about going off script. And we can see that there's therefore an inherent tension here between this, the timeliness, the free flowing, um, delightful volatility of social media and ubiquitous connect connectivity, you know, where anyone can tap out a message and, you know, we, we have um, world leadership by Twitter, of course, with Donald Trump, uh, where he just, you know, the really bad example of this, it's a couple of Big Macs, middle of the night, and fires off some uh, some crazy tweets, uh, and uh, causes chaos in the world as a consequence. In, in this completely unmediated kind of way, the vast majority of organisations that are really worried about reputational damage uh, are kind of doing exactly the opposite. They're very strictly uh, regulating their interactions, uh, the use of social media, for example, really afraid of those unguarded moments, trying to script all conversations, all events, a lot of event planning becomes super precise like this, highly controlled. Um, if anyone's been involved as either staff or volunteers or interns or in whatever capacity in a um, organized corporate event here in Japan, you would see that there is this attempt to really micromanage it, to actually hand a kind of a chuckle on the full script to the people involved and get them to follow the script um, I refuse to do most events in Japan precisely because they want to do this. You get a production company who says, now, um, Professor Chris, it's always kind of weird, but call me Chris or call me Professor Bakari or just, just call me mate or whatever. But, you know, then they say, say, what is it? It's got to say. And they've written what I have to say. I'm like, no, no one puts words in my mouth. And I would never say that. That's just like idiotic, okay? Uh, but there's there's a lot of that. They're so worried about someone getting off message and becoming controversial. Um, the other approach is with uh, a lot of television programs these days using lots of cheap um, celebrities. And um, more and more, it seems, in this uh, era of declining advertising revenues, declining eyeballs, um, mass media just goes to more and more kind of laugh with or at unfortunate looking people who um, turn their, um, their misfortunes into uh, neta into a narrative and have lots of them poorly paid. Um, but they are either very heavily scripted in the first place, or if they're more spontaneous, they're shot well in advance and um, edited up to make sure that nothing controversial would go out there and damage their reputation. So that's very much contrary to the fluidity of social media and, and uh, the capacity for anyone, for example, to do a streamed event now. You can, with a very little setup, uh, do a live streamed event through YouTube, obviously webinars and whatnot through, uh, through Zoom. Um, it's all quite understandable. Now, of course, think about this, you know, historically, uh, professors could stand in a classroom and they could make any kind of off remarks they want to. Um, here we have the situation where I'm talking to a camera, okay? And this is all being recorded. So I'm being more conscious of what I'm saying probably than I usually would be, okay? Uh, and I remember in the past, it was always a really big issue whether students would be allowed to record lectures or not. And many professors would say, no, I can't tell half of my jokes anymore. And some people say, well, maybe that's a good thing, okay? It's, it's, it's a tricky one. So as we say, see in the, in the bottom slide here, social media brings heightened vulnerabilities. Isolated images or careless speech acts can take on a life of their own. And so you can end up in this cycle of apologizing for insensitivity because some expression, maybe out of a 45 minute comment, a uh, 45 minute series of comments, one turn of phrase or something may have been captured on video and out of that context, it looks particularly damaging. 
And then, of course, we get this whole cancel culture phenomena where uh, people want to virtue signal. They want to, on social media, demonstrate their own credibility as a um, authoritative judge of good behavior. And they call people out, want to fault people for their inappropriate comments. Now, sometimes people get caught out saying the most abominable things, as we saw a Republican senator recently abused a uh, uh, young senator as a um, effing bitch, um, which was not a very nice thing to say, but a, a fellow senator on the, uh, the, the steps of Congress. Um, and so that having been captured uh, probably was a good discipline, uh, but in many cases, uh, context is lost. So given that you can mess things up quite simply um, and easily, and given that organizations are large uh, institutions, tens, even hundreds of thousands of employees, and there's always scope for things to go wrong. Uh, and of course, with ubiquitous digital records and whatnot, we get uh, more capacity to very quickly find the sources of wrong, to have leaks, for example, so organizations need to be able to acknowledge that they've made mistakes and how do they deal with those mistakes. So there's increasing professionalization of the crisis communication function. There are consultancies which just simply specialize in training business executives um, on how to communicate in a situation of a reputational crisis. Uh, they uh, bring coaches along to train people uh, to simulate press conferences, uh, this happens in Japan as well, to literally train the executives to all bow, bow uh, properly, to do the proper awabi, to uh, awabi, awabi, not awabi, I'm hungry, uh, awabi, apology, um, I just said to do proper abalone, that's quite bizarre, that's, that's an oyaji gag, I can use that, right, from the mouth of tired oyaji come oyaji gags, okay, so this uh, development of the professionalization of the redress and apology function. Of course, that immediately raises questions about how sincere are the organizations. Do they pull out the manual and they go through the rituals of apology? And uh, I, I suspect in Japan, it happens far too easily very often because it is actually a uh, well-established um, mode of dealing with an error. You simply apologize in a formal way uh, and kind of put it behind you. I know when I've been waiting for a flight in Japan and suddenly it's been canceled, for example, uh, or res rescheduling or very rarely overbooking, but uh, someone's going to get bumped in Japan, uh, they apologize. In America, they offer cash. And so I'm often left in the Japanese case saying, yes, nice words, you're apologizing, but where's the cash? Where's the 400 bucks? Or oh, no, it's just gone up to 800 bucks, calling for volunteers to take the next flight or the, or the first flight tomorrow morning or something. Um, in, in the American sense, it's very transactional. But in the American sense too, they understand something that precisely because crisis communications and particularly the corporate apology, uh, has been highly professionalized for a very long time. America probably leads, the, no, without doubt, leads the world in terms of professionalization of crisis communications and routine apologies to consumers. Uh, so this fourth point here, the apology must not be flippant and it's best backed up with a costly gesture. Now we understand this in Japan as well, more at the individual level. You know, we've seen celebrities, for example, you know, um, shave their heads to show that they're genuinely sorry, for example. This seems to be almost the default in some bukatsu sakuru where someone does the wrong thing, you know, the guys get caught smoking and so uh, they have to shave their heads, you know, to show that they're truly hansei shiteru, um, which kind of disconcerts me. Uh, but even David Beckham did this. He was very famous for his hair for a while and then he shaved his, uh, shaved his hair off and uh, bought an expensive present um, for his wife because he was caught out having a little bit of a fling with somebody. Okay, uh, so it's become almost a kind of a cliche, okay? But the uh, American organizations recognize this truth of put your money where your mouth is, that there has to be some kind of costly gesture. I'm often surprised in Japan where top executives say that they will forego um, half of their salary for one month. I always think, hmm, okay. I don't think they would cut it with American audiences because the cost is simply not large enough. 
So too quick to apologize just looks to be contrite. This is the third point, okay? Um, you can't have disingenuous denials. Yeah. So like, no, no, we didn't do that, we didn't do that. Or the classic one in Japan, um, I don't remember that kind of, I, uh, I have no recollection of that and just simply repeating this over and over again um, in a really improbable way. Or the other classic one in Japan is um, in the middle of a scandal to check yourself into hospital. Um, and if you're particularly a uh, top business executive or a political executive, particularly to check yourself into Keio Hospital, quite close to where I live. So whenever there's a kind of a political scandal, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, someone pretending to be sick in there in Keio Hospital at the moment because the media can't um, pursue you there. But there is a little bit of this costly gesture that's just stuck in hospital. No one wants to be in hospital. So it's the kind of the next best thing to actually sh saying you're sorry and admitting responsibility. Okay. Um, crisis communications, it's not just at an, uh, obviously at the company level when there's a scandal. Clearly the example I mentioned when the flight is cancelled or whatever, or overbooked, but also little practical things, you know, just little errors that have got deep um, negative implications for consumers. And I just put a really personal example here. Um, a couple of years back, I was in London for a conference um, in December and I bought a present for someone very special, Christmas present and Christmas day. Um, gave the present. It's like, oh, thanks so much. That's so nice. Oh, wait a minute. It's still got the security tag on it. Um, bought it in London, in Tokyo, Christmas Day. If you try and break those things, they pour ink all over the product and over a very fine um, Johnson cashmere scarf. That's not what you want. So, of course, I immediately emailed Liberty and said, what to do? And they said, um, Post it back to us, we'll refund the, uh, the costs to you and uh, we'll send it back to you immediately by air freight and we'll uh, give you a voucher for next time you want to shop at Liberty and you can use it online too. So very speedy response. So there is a great Japanese expression, um, even monkeys fall from trees. I always turn that to say, kora mo ki karo chiru that koalas always fall from trees. Um, the point is everyone makes mistakes. Everyone screws up. Uh, by the way, you should get that tattooed on yourself, particularly uh, during the difficult times. Never beat yourself up too much for your mistakes. Own your mistakes. As I said earlier, um, the ability to turn your own mistakes into an amusing story for your mates is a source of resilience. Um, but the more important thing in terms of the other the people affected by your mistakes is it's not that you made mistakes really it's more how you deal with your mistakes if you deal with them honestly forthrightly you want to, to make redress then actually uh, in a funny kind of way sometimes the best thing you can do is to make a mistake and then to deal with it very effectively and honestly that that actually reinforces trust in you as someone who will take responsibility uh, for your actions okay now um, let's liven things up a little bit Excuse me. Uh, a couple of organizational things. Uh, thank you everybody for your videos. Um, lots of really interesting ones. I've been uh, looking through them all and I've been in, the, I'm part way through the process of putting the playlist together. I wanted to have it done um, to launch today so that everyone can go in and see everyone's videos, although you're probably so busy this week that it'll probably be for the weekend before you can look. As it turned out, lots of you did something which I didn't think of, I didn't warn you, and it's prevented me from putting lots of your videos on the playlist. In the settings for your video, um, when you go into the settings, um, there is a, um, option to tick is this program is this for children or not for children now i think many of you took the nice innocent kind of notion oh there's nothing rude in my video this is okay for children so you ticked for children that's a problem what i need you to do is to untick that i need all of you to make your video not for children okay um now that seems counterintuitive because it's just nice videos right Although there's one guy who did a pretty interesting video. Um, 
he Harry gets targeted by the Unabomber, <laughs> gets a bomb sent to him uh, that he's got to put under next to his bed. And stay tuned for the next video to see how it plays out. I thought, um, kind of very interesting kind of video concept there. Um, so there, there are a couple other interesting ones. Ones I'll show there with a little bit of a little bit of bad language at open, but it's interesting. Um, so I need you to turn your video into not for children. And the reason being is it's just some bizarre kind of US compliance thing about protect the children from bad content or whatever. For some bizarre reason, if it's marked as for children, you cannot save the video to a playlist. I, I, I actually think that's entirely counterintuitive that actually as a parent, you would be wanting to make um, child safe playlists. Um, but somehow or another YouTube's got to this place. So please um, just uh, turn it to not for children. Then I can add it to the playlist. Um, two people posted uh, links which are now dead. Um, I think maybe updated the video or subs subsequently to posting the link. Um, I actually know two who probably don't know about it and a third one who does know about it. Um, there was an issue with the sound and was going to put a new version up and I think it's done that and now it doesn't play, but I just need the, uh, the new link. So I'll message those folks. Okay. Um, what I want to do now is just to share just um, a couple of quasi random samples of videos just to just to give you a few takeaways. You'll be able to look at them all subsequently in the playlist. I have enjoyed enormously looking at these. Um, and I've also realized that this is something I probably should do in this course every single semester. Because when I see you in your videos, you know, doing what you do, your home context and whatnot, it's going to be really difficult to give you a bad grade. You know, I just, instead of just being like a name and a number in a spreadsheet, you're like, you're really vivid you, you know, if I hear your mum laughing in the background, you know, in your video, for example, I'm thinking of your mum sad, you know, if I, if I fail you. So um, probably this is the best thing that's ever happened to you in terms of grading. You probably should ask all your professors, if you're especially you're worried about your grade, can we all submit a one minute video? Um, it's like Marius the giraffe. Once you name it, you can't kill it. Okay. Once you've actually seen someone, you know, Doing a, doing a video from their room, um, it's rather more difficult to be uh, tough on them. Okay, so let's have a look at a couple of videos. And I've, I've picked a couple that are just, they're really nice. They're just like, it goes so straight to camera pieces. Um, very simple. Um, not, you know, not, not super fancy in terms of editing the video and stuff like that, but just simply goes to show that, yeah, you can really connect with people just with a fairly straightforward kind of video. So, um, to all of those who, who have done um, uh, more sophisticated videos and whatnot, you will get your due credit and feedback and you and you get the love of the crowd. Um, but I just want to show that actually the simple videos can be uh, effective too. Now, let me see. Um, I need to... Share screen is being annoying. Bear with me. Ah, oh, here we go. Now it's working. Okay, that's the uh, those readings before I mentioned. Okay, so these are just four that I uh, want to briefly show. Okay, um, I won't show all of them. Just, just, just openings. Okay, so. Oops, hang on. I forgot to, um, you need sound. Sorry. School and weren't able to meet our okay. junior at Wasit University and summer break is just around the corner. Because of the Corona situation, uh, many of us weren't able to attend school and weren't able to meet our potential classmates. Even though the school year is coming to an end, I don't think it's silly to get to know one another, and by watching this video, if we ever get to meet each other, maybe we get to skip first impression. So by watching this video, I want to give you a glimpse of what kind of person I am, and 
Let's get started. So I was born in Japan, but moved to California and grew up there till high school. This is my graduation photo, and that's me in the middle, the guy with the great smile. But after high school, I decided to go to Japan to study in Waseda University. And despite being ethnically Japanese, I still struggled a lot with the culture and the language. But by meeting new people and making new friends, I was able to slowly adapt to the new country. And currently today, I'm living a great life in the city of Tokyo. Now I want to go over my hobbies. Uh, over the years, my hobbies have changed many, many times because suddenly I'll get an urge to try something new or all of a sudden lose interest in certain things. But nonetheless, I want to share some of the things that I love to do every single day today. Number one, music. First, I love listening to music and singing songs, but also I love playing instruments too, even though I really suck. Some of my favorite genres are, you know, like throwbacks, like 60s, 70s, 80s, just pretty much songs where you can actually understand the lyrics and you can actually sing along to. From today's genre, I'm really interested in indies. Let's go, sorry to cut you off there. <laughs> right. And another one from Maho. Hello, my name is Maho. And this video is about what I'm like. Growing up, I lived in Singapore for four years and in the United States for about three years. I regret not staying in touch with many of my friends over the years. However, I've kept almost all the letters and little notes my friends have written to me ever since first grade. I treasure them so much. And also, I have a tendency to collect and hoard things. I could never be a minimalist. One of the things I enjoy doing is editing. I like picking a theme, thinking about the layout, curating images, and all that. I was on the yearbook committee in middle school and high school, made brochures and posters for my high school brass band, and was part of the Milestone Editorial Club last year. I also love traveling, which seems like a luxury now more than ever. That's really nice. So thank you very much. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, <laughs> you got her. I'm picking on you for this one. I know. I some people do some really gutsy things, and um, this guy is also in an intermediate seminar and is a really active participant there. And uh, so I kind of I watched this one. And I thought, oh, okay, the opening. This is kind of interesting. And then he did something that I thought took real guts, and um, it's. it's Check it out yourselves. Uh. I look fucking stupid. Hey, just appreciate my spirit of challenging, please. Jeez. From the start, I'm one of the smart, logical knowledge packed in the cart. Need more to meet my curiosity. Running and running with a tremendous velocity. New ideas, values are shining treasure. Meeting them is my absolute pleasure. Understanding is the main objective. Outstanding how I am receptive. Being rational is my goal. That's the style that lifts my soul. When we fell, escaping passion, the result would be devastating concussion. Now, I reckon that some Jun Japa rap is seriously cool. So excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and then kind of not picking on my Zemise here. Uh, uh, Luna, Luna made a really nice video, but I also want to show this too, because I want to, everyone to know just um, some of the amazing talent we actually have in Silts. Um, uh, Luna actually represents Japan. Japan in ballroom dancing is extraordinarily accomplished um, and is a really good student too. So I, I, I don't know how you manage to balance it all, but uh, let's have a look at uh, a fair bit of Luna's video. Uh, not least because it's just so awesome for her talent, but also the video itself is very nicely put together. And um, she also made a uh, very, I won't say cynical, but a, uh, a very clever a clever kind of pitch to work me into her video, um, making herself looking um, scholarly to boot. So kind of good on message, know what will resonate with the audience, say moi, okay? So let's have a look. 
Sorry, let's go back to the beginning. Okay. That is certainly a feat. <laughs> um, yeah, um, obviously awesome production. Uh, now I've got a message in chat. Let me see that. Right. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Ah, Michael would absolutely love to, but I haven't got. It. I, I only save four to a separate playlist just to be able to get it now. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to. I, I would love to have done that, but uh, but no um sorry sorry i cut straight away okay uh right uh so thank you very much for your efforts there now uh things in terms of, uh i take very seriously feedback uh for all your great works um i have just been insanely busy in the last few weeks trying to keep up particularly with the introduction of business having locked myself into all this video on demand content um and so that's oops what do i just I, there we go so I thought I'd kill that for a moment while it was activated another screen. So I've been, uh, been flat strapped trying to get all of that done. So I'm very conscious that you've had no feedback yet on your A1 and of course your, your A2 here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is over the first week of August and maybe into the second week of August, um, I'll be giving everyone individual feedback um, in totality on all of the items that you have submitted. 
And so very uh, grateful for everyone's engagement. And uh, the uh, particularly the video exercise, I've, I've realized just how many people went to a very considerable effort to um, get material together, uh, develop some um, videoing and editing skills and whatnot. And hopefully those skills will stand you in good stead for doing a whole lot of things uh, subsequently. Okay, uh, now one of our other topics is uh, changing values and corporate communication. So the law dimension, uh, the, the logic of making markets working better by requiring everyone in the market to put informa more information about themselves to investors, to customers, to regulators and whatnot. Um, in some sense, that's fairly logical stuff, quite easy to understand. Uh, so it is spelled out in those slides and look through it. Um, I instead now want to show some examples of past advertisements, um, which for obvious reasons, I don't want to distribute partly copyright issues, but also it's, I don't want to be you to think that I'm somehow endorsing the message of some of these, but it's very interesting to look at old advertisements and realize actually how much values have changed enormously. Many of these advertisements are just completely unthinkable today because they're shamelessly sexist in one case, pretty obviously, um, um, kind of, if not race, if not race, racist, at least very um, ethnocentric. Okay, uh, so we do get a real sense of changing values. So I'm going to run through some of these. Okay, so changing values in corporate communication. So you're going to see them here, but uh, you're not going to get them as a download. Okay. So corporate communications must keep track of changing social norms and has in the past been understandably uh, criticized for reinforcing bad culture. Uh, this, this is part of the slide set on law and uh, culture, for example. Okay, so many of these are American ones, post-war American ones that uh, show the wife as dependent, a housewife, um, completely beholden to her husband, and her duty being to please her husband. How could they get away with this advertising? Well, precisely because women were dependent. Uh, that um, the when the husband brought income into the family, the husband had a remarkable veto and very bad veto power over the brands that were bought, the products that were bought and whatnot. So very often, although a woman would be using the product, it was as much sold to her husband because he was the one that would approve the purchase because women had uh, no financial um, independence uh, in the, uh, the, the single income household. The very reverse of what we, what we saw with um, the, the clever uh, recent commercials for Old Spice, where you're actually selling the, uh, the body wash uh, product to women who are buying it for their man, who like, has bad man smell. Okay, so the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. Okay, vitamins to pepper up so she can clean the house better. Um, this is Del Monte ketchup. You can buy Del Monte ketchup here in Japan all the time. You mean a woman can open it? Okay, um, clearly it was a male dominated advertising industry at the time that came up with that one. Um, the chef, this is the Kenwood chef, still a huge selling product um, in a more modern version. The chef does everything but cook. That's what wives are for. Okay, um, and you see, I'm giving my wife a Kenwood chef. So this was um, aimed at men to buy, ironically, a Mother's Day present. I always thought of this as, you know, show, show respect to mum on Mother's Day by buying her a um, device so she can get to work in the kitchen. I always thought it was a bit surreal. Um, <laughs> I uh, recently, by the way, was at the, the hairdressers and uh, mentioned it was um, my uh, partner's birthday the next day and had to get a present. And um, so a couple of the junior staff said, oh, how about you get some, uh, you yeah, know, like, uh, um, like a face massage or something like that. Just to be all goods again, you know? And I said, you can say that when you're in your twenties, but if you're giving it to someone in their forties, that's got all the wrong message. It's kind of saying like, Hey, lift your game. You're looking a bit, 
you're looking a bit past it, okay? So the very opposite, uh, that uh, if you really want to show respect on Mother's Day or the birthday or something, you have something that, that they want that gives them time off. Give them a voucher to a spa or something, okay? More of these selling vitamins. Keep up with the house um, while you keep down your weight. Don't get fat, keep the house tidy, okay? Um, and have, have some vitamins which are included in this cereal. Okay, selling to men directly. A cigar brings out the caveman in you. Oh dear. Okay, uh, this is even, even uh, more brazen. Don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. Okay, so she's having a cry because she burnt the dinner, but he's forgiving because he's got the beer. This one is incredibly brazen, stacked for convenience. Um, I'm not going to even get into this, but the picture of the woman suggests um, what the colloquial expression English stacked refers to. Um, because at the end of the day, although the man might never cook, he was the one who was going to pay for the expensive new installed um, mi microwave oven and regular oven um, and that's stacked on top of each other. Okay, uh, Japanese companies in the American market uh, weren't uh, averse to gross sexism in their advertising. The Subaru Coupe, like a spirited woman who yearns to be tamed. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, American Airlines, think of her as your mother. Um, that, that, that actually is, is um, it's, it's very sophisticated in its sexism, actually. Uh, be precisely because the vast majority of men would look at that image and think, no, I'm not thinking of mum like that. Um, and that's actually precisely how they want to, they want to engage the audience. So, oh, yeah, look at this, literally to pass the, uh, the magazine or the newspaper around the guys at work and then to read the copy. And it's then a narrative about service. Okay. Um, Van Heusen shirts. Van Heusen is one of the oldest and still very significant brands for business shirts. So um, here he is, the boss, spanking his secretary, kissing his secretary without permission, apparently. Um, but it's okay because he's got bolder shirts and he can get away with that. Okay. And this one is just gross. Um, blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. Um, selling mini cigars. Terrific. Okay, uh, away from sexism <laughs> to nascent racism. Um, did you ever see a fat Chinese? Actually, yes. <laughs> I'm seeing lots of fat people in a whole bunch of places. Okay, um, but what was this about? Well, this is actually, as it says down the bottom, this message is brought to you as a public service by the Rice Council of America. Um, switch from routine to rice. What it was saying was um, the meat is center of plate. So Americans like a big steak, and then on the side, your carbohydrate, rather than your potatoes and whatnot, you could have rice, and supposedly it would be healthier. Hence this notion, did you ever see a fat Chinese, which is just cringeful. Um, then, of course, selling drinks um, to give them to children. Um, this is from the Soda Pop Board of America, which, of course, was... It sounds like a very scientific organization. Uh, it was a front organization by major soft drink sellers to promote um, giving soft drinks to children. For a better start in life, start cola earlier, okay? Um, and have no teeth by the age of three. Um, and of course, seven up. Um, and here's one of those really, really cynical things that uh, you see represented in ad men in Mad Men, the TV series, but was actually well understood as a, as a way of dealing with negative issues. Um, actually, uh, when this appeared, there was a lot of criticism emerging from health experts saying it's absolutely terrible to give sugary drinks to little kids. Uh, and so the major drinks manufacturers, Coca-Cola and whatnot, felt um, under threat. So rather than, rather than just simply either distract from it um, or to say, no, 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 they flip it. And they say, yes, we have the youngest customers in the business. Why we have the youngest customers in the business? And they launch into a narrative about how good their, uh, their product is. I mean, from by modern standards are utterly obscene. One of the most famous around, of course, is the Marlboro Man. 
And uh, this was a series that ran for decades. Uh, there were a lot of commercials, very recognizable music and whatnot. Um, I remember going as a kid to the cinema all the time and it would always be the Marlboro Man commercials and I could hum the music, dun, 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 you know. So everyone knew the, knew the tune and all of these striking, very beautiful images um, stills photography and, and uh, moving images um, of scenes of real men out in the Midwest of America, the Marlboro Man. And this guy um, was the Marlboro Man. He eventually died of lung cancer. And before he died, uh, he said that smoking was the stupidest thing he'd ever done. Um, and that he felt bad about having done that. And their famous catch copy, which they use forever, come to where the flavor is. Um, this nonsensical, nonsensical kind of notion that uh, flavor varied greatly with cigarettes. Um, it does through the chemical additives they do, but not the basic tobacco. Okay, come to where the flavor is, come to Marlborough country and these depictions of the Marlborough man. And this went on for literally uh, decades until finally cigarette advertising was banned. Okay. And uh, when they were, the tobacco companies were attacked for the health consequences of smoking, they quite cynically brought out a series of products that were referred to as lights, okay? Um, so there was absolutely nothing light in terms of the carcinogenic risk involved. Um, but of course, a combination of bans on advertising, public health campaigns, and say in the Australian case, for example, world leading campaign now where it is required by law on every packet of cigarettes to cover the entire packet um, either plain paper packaging um, or, uh, and or uh, gross images of disease associated with smoking. Hugely effective and particularly because little kids look at it and think, oh, that's disgusting. Daddy put the cigarette out to the point where this article appeared in the Australian newspaper back in 2015 and says smoking has become a public declaration of stupidity. Okay. And um, talks about uh, apparently a real situation of a, of a child um, who hadn't grown up with smokers around them because the population now only about 15% uh, of people smoke um, in Australia. And if you bore down into suburbs, middle class, upper middle class areas, it's incredibly low, it's well, below, it's well into single digits. And so you literally don't see people smoking very much and you can't smoke in public places anymore. Uh, and so that it looks incongruous. And do keep this in mind when you're doing job hunting, actually, if you're asked if you're a smoker, because it's, uh, as it says down here, um, it's been more and more seen to be an uh, indicator of a lack of control, um, a lack of self-discipline and a refusal to um, acknowledge the truth about uh, cigarettes. I mean, that said, several of my very good students are going to work for cigarette company, tobacco companies, <laughs> uh, but clearly there has been a, a shift in terms of thinking over time with changing values. Okay. Um, okay, quick question. Release feedback on the quizzes on Moodle. Um, well, you, you can check your answers and you can find what's right and wrong. Um, so I pretty much think you're kind of covered there. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, just looking at time, I want to move to our final conclusions. Okay. And I think we're going to finish pretty much bang on time. Excuse me a moment. Okay, so 12 intense weeks, uh, coming a lot, uh, a little bit too quickly and uh, Normally I revel having the, uh, the double period so that actually I can show all those video materials that are online for you there that relates to each week. Don't forget to look at that for the, uh, the final topics, 19 to 22, they're relevant as well for the, uh, for the quiz, okay? Um, so first of all, uh, this sign used to infuriate me every time I walked down to Bubba. Uh, it is to the point, it is direct. Uh, they very clearly signal the customers they want, but it also speaks to some really interesting kind of ethical questions about um, 
is it desirable to be honest in your prejudice? Okay. Um, I just inherently hate this because there is a far simpler way to discriminate against students. And to some degree they are, but there's a far more effective way to discriminate. And that is just discriminate by price. Okay. Um, you make a belgi be a, a thousand yen or 1200 yen, probably even 800 yen. Not many students are going to come anyway. Uh, we see this debate, uh, endless discussion in Japan about prejudice by real estate agents. Uh, actually, the closest real estate agent to Wasada, that actually they're right in a Wasada own building there um, in the Step 21, they actually have the bookend divided into Gaikokujin Ka and Gaikokujin Fuka. Um, and when I saw that, I, was, I just thought that was utterly outrageous. Their response was, uh, So you should be brazen in your prejudice in order to not waste the, the victim's time. Um, that is a very dangerous argument, um, but that is actually quite a, a ubiquitous argument. Um, uh, here in Japan, and the uh, there is a truth of of hidden prejudice that prejudice can go underground when spe um, speech acts, for example, and communicative acts are heavily regulated. Um, however, the contrary argument is that communications itself is culture validating. What we saw with those dramatic um, images from the past that now are completely unthink unthinkable, highly sexist advertising that in its day were considered reasonable, but there were many critics and the advertising industry kind of cleaned up its act and, you know, with its clients. And as a consequence, that does nudge the culture. So when open prejudice is on the grounds of honesty, um, accepted for pragmatic reasons, it's also kind of validating of prejudice. And that is a tricky, tricky, tricky ongoing issue. Um, and see, it's particularly tricky because uh, I, I think a powerful argument is that a key ethical imperative and arguably the dominant ethical imperative in our liberal society where we can freely collaborate, freely associate with others is to disclosure, to be honest with people. When there is an asymmetry of commitment um, of people to a relationship, for example, as I say down the bottom, no, entering any partnership Knowing, for example, that uh, you're planning to leave town in three months or something and not telling the people involved um, in a business project or a relationship or whatever, neglecting to mention you're married, for example, in most cultures is considered to be truly abominable. Um, so this, this duty of disclosure is a key thing. And in terms of regulating economies, that uh, over a century and a half has evolved as a key legal principle. So I think we can extend it in general to liberal society. And I'm conscious we're right at time, so I'll zoom through. So some key overall summaries. Um, the shift from bought to earned media is one of our really big themes. Shifting from buying expensive rationed access to key media channels to intense competition for audience attention. And that's why I gave you the chapter that I had written on this. It's about the attraction and retention of audience interest. And importantly, that conversion of interest into action. Okay, it's not just about getting their attention, it's about getting them to do what you want them to do, buy your product, for example. Okay, um, so there's a huge array of emerging tactics and creative endeavors to gain buzz that we've talked about, and very importantly, the, uh, the need for perceived authenticity is one of the predominant values of our time, as well as narratives of origins. In this context of globalization, cosmopolitanism, uh, we're, always, we're temporarily stuck where we are, uh, but narratives of origins and values and distinctiveness matter all the more so. And various reasons for this, minimum standards of product functionality and reliability have just been raised substantially. So consumers have a hard time differentiating products. Why should I buy the more expensive one rather than cheaper one? Okay. So trying to compete just simply on quality alone, the attributes of the product is rather difficult because your competitors can very quickly copy what you do, unless it's super high tech and with proprietary knowledge, for example. So the narrative function uh, becomes a significant way of differentiation. 
and indeed in that that excellent um, presentation the the, uh, the TED talk uh, that we saw there about how perceived value through narrative is um, one of the the most potent forms of con contemporary value creation design is a fundamental part of that as well um, consistent brand personality uh, from the core product attributes right through to the corporate communications we see that with apple for example the uh, the aesthetics the values in um, embodied in the apple uh, store experience not in their staff necessarily as i've already complained about okay um, i've already spoken about this i covered the theory so the critical thing there is we can think of postmodern audiences where audience find their own meaning in corporate communications and brands but there's some interesting issues about the are we losing faith in optimistic scientific rationality in expertise in facts um, people looked at trump and looked at brexit and said yes definitely no one wanted to hear what the economist said COVID 19 maybe has restored um, a recognition of the importance of expertise, although I would say that experts themselves have done no favours by not being, by often treating people like idiots and not being fully honest in their communications. And the mask issue is the classic one. We have gone in, uh, in Australia and the United States from saying no one needs to wear a mask, they're not effective uh, normally, for mere mortals who don't know how to put them on and take them off, unless you're a doctor, because doctors, doctors are smart. Um, two, in the case of Victoria, $200 fine if you do not wear a mask when you leave your house, okay? And naturally people are wondering, hang on, three months ago you said you said I didn't need one, now you're saying um, I'm a criminal if I don't have one, or it's a misdemeanor, okay? So uh, postmodern audiences themselves are more interested in uh, people they respect to curating cultural product for them and then themselves becoming curators in this mutual in interdependent way design thinking was one of our key analytical frames um, and if there's one thing I think you can take from this course and use to sell yourself in pretty much any job interview maybe unless you want to be a school teacher or something um, but even then design thinking is actually being applied in schools very interestingly um, that this is uh, very much a hot topic um, in Japan and many places now. And so I think we, we can all benefit from an, a regular refamiliarization of those design thinking precepts that we, uh, we looked at earlier in the course. And just to simply emphasize that highly constrained problems um, lead to greater creativity. That the more difficult a problem in the sense of the budgetary constraints, the uh, the functions you need to satisfy, the whims of a client, for example, the more constrained, the more difficult it is, the harder you have to work, um, and therefore it's likely to be far more innovative. And this applies in so many domains. People pointed out that one of the best examples is the Kalashnikov machine gun, for example, um, developed in the Soviet Union. It had to be cheap, indestructible, um, and became is still the preferred weapon of choice for guerrilla movements all, all over the world, okay? So everything is in flux now, quite aside from COVID-19. Uh, the old certainties of media, of communications are all being smashed. Um, everyone is claiming to be digital now. Pretty much everyone who claims to be an expert in digital has only been doing it for a maximum of about three years, okay? Um, which means that Young folks like yourself, you can go into, uh, into firms, into agencies, into boutique consultancies, and you can be really at the forefront of this, this transformation. You're um, as advanced as anyone um, in terms of understanding the, the digital landscape, um, particularly after done your projects and stuff, okay? And so you can really make this your stuff. Um, and then finally, what I mentioned, that example of ongoing innovation um, with a design um, thinking twist, uh, the, uh, the humble leaf blower repurposed um, as a weapon against the, the uh, police and the truly awful tear gas. By the way, the tear gas that's used in America is actually the US military is banned from using it because it's been deemed to use it in a military context as a war crime. Um, but you're allowed to use it on your own citizens, which is very surreal. Anyway. Okay, a um, bit over time, so um, right, okay, uh, yeah, um, finally just think someone just asked about the PDF I showed with the videos, bef with the images before, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm 
not putting those images up because I don't have copyright to them. Some of them were taken from books, um, and particularly one with the fat Chinese. I actually took it at a bookshop because it's so famous. Um, so I want to get a copy there. So the other set of slides that talks in more detail about the uh, compliance issues and whatnot. So read through those yourselves. Um, and um, if you need to, you can review the uh, this video here. I'll edit this and put it up. Okay, that's um, that's us done for the se semester. Um, I've run five minutes over time, but I was really worried about whether I was going to be able to fit this into into twelve weeks rather than the usual fifteen and half the uh, the class contact hours. So I know it's been a bit of a forced march. Thank you for for bearing with me. Um, I'm going to hang around if there's any uh, questions and answers you you have. Um, unfortunately, next semester is a predominantly virtual one. Um, like I say, anyone in the market for an advanced course would love to have you in enterprise and governance. It's a bit heavier academically um, than this one. Of course, the great thing about communication design is lots of cool videos and things like that. Um, but the enterprise and governance course is, uh, is my kind of capstone unit. It's kind of everything you need to know about capitalism uh, to be a savvy citizen. Uh, and I try and work on a whole bunch of themes that are relevant to yourselves, things like aging societies and inequality and globalization. And I'm gonna work in a whole lot of things about COVID-19 impacts and what does this global recession, possibly even depression, show us about our capitalist system. So. Um, I'm, I'm going to make it very contemporary, but also historical. We, we start off talking about old trade routes in um, Roman Empire and whatnot, and, and then draw the similarities with Silicon Valley. Uh, so if you, if you want a one-stop kind of, this is how capitalism kind of works in the past, the present, maybe the future, maybe that would be interesting uh, for you. Okay, all the best for summer when it finally arrives. It's insane that we're gonna to have to see you all the way into August. If you're in a sunny place, um, good luck to you, okay, and share the joy. So thank you very much for bearing with me for so long. Um, I have enjoyed this uh, virtual journey more than I expected, actually. I was terrified in the beginning. And many of you have been incredibly generous with your patience and your feedback. So I thank you for that. Okay. Um, and I think we've learned a lot of lessons and many of the hiccups that we've seen this semester won't be in the fall. If we get Moodle fixed in time. Okay. Uh, I got an email this morning about that. The system keeps crashing. Okay. Which is pretty ugly. Okay. Um, but I think over the semester, they're going to be adding a hell of a lot more processor <laughs> um, server capacity to try and uh, iron those ripples out. So thank you. Um, those of you who need to go off to other classes, I'll let you do that. Um, don't forget you've got that uh, quiz, which needs to be done by midnight on Friday. Okay. And also, I didn't mention uh, the forum peer assessment. It's a very simple thing. Download the, uh, the one page. Um, very simple criteria. Um, for those of you who can hang around, I'll tell you about it straight away. For those of you to Zoom, I'll be to go. Zoom, oh God, I can't set it the same way again. Um, da, da, da. It uh, just looks like that. Those of you who've been in my courses before have seen a version of this. Um, criteria is very simple. Um, active, timely, encouraging, and wise. Okay, <laughs> and you just get to indicate where the people were active, timely, encouraging, or wise. Okay, so that's a criteria for me. Oh dear. Thank you very much. Okay, and look forward to meeting you in person as soon as possible. Oh, a final thing. Um, we looks like, assuming we don't get a horrible second wave of corona, although we're going to have a virtual semester predominantly, um, students will be able to come on campus, and I will certainly be amenable to people coming by um, to say hi, you know, one-to-one um, -one kind of consultation with a modicum of kind of social distancing in my office. I'll throw salt over you. No, we'll use those salt over me. I don't know. Um, so yeah, if you find your way onto the campus in the uh, fall, there will definitely be an opportunity to say hi and catch up in person. So I look forward to that. Okay, thank you very much.